Indian governments in tackling the Kashmir issue. As a matter of fact, the former governments did retain a semblance of constitutionality, although they too had been consistently pursuing the policies of Kashmir's forcible enslavement, considering this religion as their atut ang, integral part. Actually, this atut ang philosophy of the state of India is the mother of all ills and evils. But unfortunately, Modi Sarkar considers it mothers of all cures. However, Modi Sarkar has surpassed all the Delhi governments of the bygone days by abrogating Articles 370 and 35A of the Indian Constitution that conferred special status on occupied Kashmir besides pledging not to change the demographic status of this territory. It may be noted that the aforesaid articles in corporation in the Indian Constitution immediately after the Park India Subcontinent Independence 1947 did create the impression in for the foreign capitals that India was not trampling its former Premier Jawaharlal Nehru, Jawaharlal Nehru solemn pledge made at international forums. It was rather Nehru who took the lead in pledging to the United Nations Security Council that a plebiscite would be held in Kashmir to ascertain the will of the people of Kashmir. The conferment of special status on Kashmir under Article 370 was in fact in line with this solemn pledge as well as in line with the Security Council resolutions accepting the right of self-determination of the people inhabiting the Kashmir. What did the Kashmiris get? <clears throat> Thereafter is a sad story. Instead of giving them the right of choice, their bodies were pierced with bullets. Those protesting against coercion, high-handedness of the state machinery and usurpation of their due rights would be abducted and made to disappear for years. Women crying against their widowhood or forced disappearances of their male members would be gang raped by merciless Indian troops, which use the mass humiliation methodology as a tool of oppression, as they deem it to be an effective tool of subjugation and enslavement. Now that a year has gone by since the abrogation of Articles 370 and 35A, Kashmiri Muslims continue to face abject misery at the hands of Indian tyrants and their merciless forces, which have unleashed a reign of terror in the shape of killing of unarmed Kashmiri freedom seekers, siege, lockdown, and total blockade of communication. Not to name the blinding of peaceful Kashmiri youth and children with the use of pallet guns. Above all, the ruthless practice of forced disappearances has intensified. The troops making excessive use of powers conferred on them through the promulgation of Armed Forces Special Powers Act and Public Safety Acts. Such powers are not even enjoyed by judges in any country of the world. These soldiers can either, these soldiers can enter, rather break into any house without a search warrant and can take away any person on the pretext of suspicious conduct. 
A large number of them have never returned home, leaving thousands of widow, widows or half-widows and half-orphans behind. The discovery of mass graves in the Kashmir Valley speaks volumes of such atrocities which are being camouflaged under the banner of constitution with unjust and unjustified amendments. Read abrogation. Made in it in sheer disregard for the universal principles of national justice. Even their own constitution debars Indian Parliament from change of special status without initiation of a move from the State Assembly, which means the Kashmir Assembly. And for as for Article 35A, it guaranteed no changes in the demography, demography of Kashmir Valley. But now, after the article's repeal, Modi Sarkar has picked up momentum at a very fast pace to neutralize the Muslim majority in the valley. In this regard, a large number of non-Muslims from outside Kashmir are being given incentives and facilitation to settle there and also buy properties in sheer violation of the true original spirit of Indian constitution. All this is happening under the aegis of democratically elected government that claims to be a torchbearer of democracy, simultaneously bragging time and again that India is the biggest or one of the biggest democracy of the world. Is this Indian version of democracy all about invading and enslaving a small peaceful fraternity of Kashmiri Muslims? Maybe the international community cannot provide a reply to this question. But let me assure you that under the leadership of Prime Minister Imran Khan, we have dedicated all our efforts to project the issue of Kashmir at all international fora. We shall continue to do so and we shall continue to lend our moral and ethical support to the Kashmiri brethren in their just struggle for the right to self-determination. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Especially after 9-11, tried to link the global narrative of terrorism with the freedom struggle in Kashmir. And let's be honest, given its clout and power and lobbies, it did dent Pakistan's image abroad. Today, a year from August 5th, there is no Western country, there is no newspaper, and there is no media, electronic media channel of note that has not called the Indian government fascist, that has not talked about the reign of terror that they have spread, quite frankly, throughout India, but illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir specifically. And the very voices, I saw this myself in the United States, the very voices in the United States Congress and Senate and the UK uh, Parliament who would not talk about anything but the Indian narrative. Every conversation would start from what is Pakistan doing uh, across the LOC have now pointedly passed resolutions, written letters, and talked about the real face of the so-called secular democracy. The narrative of India in the world has never been more challenged and more neg negative than it is today. And please, not for a second should you think that this is happening without an effort. Number one by the Kashmiris themselves and the Kashmiri diaspora around the world, but second, with full political, diplomatic and moral support of the government in the state of Pakistan. Second, what is Pakistan's narrative? Only two. 
Number one, human rights violations against the Kashmiris. The corona epidemic was used by the Modi government to essentially increase the level of oppression and violations of human rights of the Kashmiris in the illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. If some of you are not familiar, I would suggest you go back today and Google something called the typhus epidemic during World War II and read what the Nazi regime was saying about that epidemic being spread by the Jews and how it was done. And you will find that the language that you've gotten from Indian officials, BJP officials, senior officials about Muslims spreading Corona is identical. So when the Prime Minister of Pakistan talks about the Nazi inspired Modi regime, there are historical facts backing that day in and day out. India is liable given that it's an occupied territory under the Fourth Geneva Convention Article 55-56 to ensure all medical and emergency supplies in a pandemic situation to people of IOJK, illegally occupied Kashmir. Not only that, under Article 59, groups like Doctors Without Borders and others in the international community, they are mandated to allow them to go in and provide that relief that they are unable to or unwilling to provide. So the second narrative Pakistan has is that India is breaching international law, not only in terms of the UN resolutions, but every single day in terms of how they have handled the illegally occupied territory since August 5th. Third, the world talked about and does talk about India, especially the United States and others, as the net security provider. That's the term that they coined. They've talked about the Indo-Pacific strategy where they're joining hands with India to check China's expansion rise. But here's the question I asked the international community in my interactions. You've got a country in South Asia that called itself the, the regional pivot has a confrontation with China and gets the result that, that it did, eggs on an infinitely smaller neighbor to stand up, produce a new map and a ne Nepalese parliament to reject India's standpoint, view and aggression towards Nepal. Even Bangladesh is having problems with this country. And last year you saw this country claim that it conducted airstrikes against another nuclear country. You've seen the result last year with Pakistan, but you've also seen how devious the mindset is that you trigger a crisis, you are found woefully inadequate, you lose the crisis, you have a pilot down, in our magnanimity we return the pilot and a political party spins it to win the election and declare a hero out of somebody who was returned voluntarily by Pakistan. That tells you how devious the intent, mindset and how misleading the narrative is for the Indian citizen itself. What has happened with China? They are trying to do exactly the same. Of course, not succeeding this time, but trying exactly the same. So, if I were to bring all of this together, we are seeing a country that is moving in a direction where actually, inshallah, the cause of self-determination of Kashmir is being fulfilled by the very country that thinks that it has taken control of the illegally occupied territory. 
where the Kashmiri stood a year ago to where it stands today, let me give you three categorical irreversible differences. If there was anybody in the Kashmir Valley that did not outright hate India, that category of people has vanished forever. I'm not, sp I'm giving you, this is information, credible knowledge that we have and has been portrayed publicly by others as well. Second, the support for Pakistan is highest in recent history. I'll give you a very, very small anecdote, it's very interesting and I actually didn't know this at the time but this time Pakistan celebrated Eid one day before India. Eid was on Sunday, the Eid al-Fitr was on Sunday here uh, which was I, I, if I recall correctly the same as the Middle East but India and Bangladesh um, had it on Monday. Kashmir declared Eid on Sunday Literally minutes after, I think our Eid was declared at 10.30 at night or whatever, it uh, habitually delayed. But 10 minutes or 15 minutes after that, the Muslims of Kashmir, uh, illegally occupied Kashmir in the valley, declared Eid in solidarity with Pakistan. And when I asked people about this, they said this wasn't to spite India. This was actually to support Pakistan. That's the second major change. And the third major change is that I'm the first one to confess that the response that we've gotten from the world is not nearly as humane, as moralistic, and as positive as it should have been in a fairer world. It's definitely not. The world is still turning it a blind eye towards the kind of atro atrocities and oppression that the Kashmiris are facing every day. And if they weren't, ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you, why hasn't India allowed foreign journalists to go and see what is happening? Why hasn't the UN been allowed to go in? Why is Amnesty saying what it's saying? This is the largest open jail in the world. There can be no two views about it. But the third difference that I want to end on is very important. No Western media or press outlet is using the word terrorism for Kashmir anymore. Even the most allied of allies of India cannot stand up in support of what is happening. If they are not opposing them, they are not supporting them. And while there has been very little tangible action, and that's deplorable by the international community, each one of them have told us that what India is doing is not sustainable. We don't condone it. We will continue to press India on human rights violations. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the beginning of the end. And the end is self-determination of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Thank you very much.